I said to myself, I will consider broadly tonight just two of these fundamental topics that have re-emerged, as it were, in my mind as I thought about Africa Day. We've had a very, very exceptional few weeks in South Africa. That's an understatement. <laughs> Over issues of leadership, ownership of responsibility, at the highest level, Nochal, right? Not here with us, but at the highest level. How must leadership be shaped for a time such as this in the continent? That's the one thing I thought of that we should address. Another very disturbing development has had me wonder about the interpretation and role of culture in Africa as part of a global world. But given the fact that it is so important in a world of today that we respect human rights. You know, when I served at the European Union as our ambassador, South Africa's ambassador, negotiating with the European Union, 15 member states sitting there, small South Africa sitting this side, and Alti Link sitting in the middle, formidable opposition on issues of trade, investment, agriculture, sacred to them. There are three principles that underpin all agreements with the European Union. The first one they call the rule of law. The second one they say a policy of anti-corruption. In other words, that must be a sacred aspect of the relationship, underpinning the relationship. And thirdly, respect for human rights. And should you renege on any of these, individually or collectively, that agreement falls flat. And that, to me, was very significant. If you do not subscribe to the respect for human rights, you won't be able to negotiate and implement any agreement with the European <coughs> Union. Now, the... The Charter, the African Charter on Human and People's Rights adopted on the 28th of June 1981 by the states of the Organization of African Union, which is now the, uh, the African Union, has largely served as the basis of human rights framework on the African continent. However, despite having good reason to celebrate such a developed and a nuanced human rights framework for Africa, the acceptance of the universality of human rights has not been easy. What is of unique importance in Africa, though, is the diversity of its members. We all know that. Its states and even national populations. Even in this country, we find the lack of efficient and well-functioning, well-capacitated institutions create endless frustrations in serving delivery. So, what are we saying? We're saying that in this environment in Africa, the continent, we have had, yes, a respect for human rights. Our problem has been, to a great extent, exacerbated by the differing levels of development. Also institutions. You know, one of the big differences between a successful country and a not so successful country is the existence of efficient and functioning institutions. If you take in the area of human rights, of the legal rights, the rule of law, if your courts aren't functioning, if in the social arena your societal institutions aren't functioning, your schools aren't functioning, you might as well close shop. <coughs> what is notable is that moving successfully in either direction of state institutional strengthening or increasing the scope of state functions is significantly dependent on the success of securing and effectively establishing the basic minimal functions of providing that type of pure public good, as the economist would call it. Let me summarize 
quickly what Stacy, my daughter, is saying. She is saying that in the context of human rights in Africa specifically, we have been influenced to a great extent by the Western understanding of the concept of human rights. And what is that for the European Union, for instance? Where's my good friend John Powell now? They have given us, no, not given, they have subjected us to a human rights that is very narrowly defined in terms of individual rights. In fact, in Africa, we have broadened the context of human rights, where there are individual human rights or human rights pertaining to the individual. In Africa, there is a context that is much wider called culture. And we must never, ever underestimate the role of this concept of culture that is part of the human right. In other words, the individual right vests itself in a culture. In Africa, we have a combination of these. And the challenge for you and me and that which we have to discuss from day to day is what is the ideal balance between the component of culture? And this is where I think it is important for us not to see these as mutually exclusive. They are in fact supportive of each other. Another example that she mentions, and a very important one in African societies, is religion. Religion is also one of those rights uh, as a cornerstone of values and human rights in Africa, unlike the West. And the West is not undergoing a process uh, of religious um, development, as it were, expansion, as much as Africa. In fact, the West is in a process of more secularization than Africa. This has a very, very profound impact on not only the role of religion in international affairs, but more specifically the role of religion and the necessity to place importance on religion as an important variable in the proliferation and protection of human rights in Africa. And this is the challenge on Africa Day, 50 years, that we celebrate, that I want to leave with you on the one hand. The other one that I thought I have to just touch on is the question of leadership. And, you know, in his book entitled Let Africa Lead, Joel Koza, great businessman in South Africa, describes an ideal Africa as one where the leaders serve the people, right? Where the hello teachings of the ancestors, our ancestors, will direct us as how to live our lives now and plan for the future. That's the ideal, that we reflect on our forefathers' admonitions. And then thirdly, where we invest time, resources, and aspirations in the future of our children. That, what does that others say other than educate? The ideal Africa has again a very sound balance between the Ubuntu principle of sharing on the one hand, and on the other hand, you have the market system or the capitalist system, the business system of maximizing profits. Again, a balance that you must create, that you must find between sharing and working for maximizing your profits. Any of the leaders in Africa that wants to stand the test of time should have inner shape. It's a 
beautiful concept which actually refers to the shape that has emerged from a very deep understanding of the moral purpose of leadership. And that moral purpose of leadership, that understanding is supported by the level of reflection, introspection, emotional and cultural necessity to embrace and honor the past and dealing competently with the present and the future. A true African leader is a leader who serves, who understands the importance of relationship between him herself and the people. Leadership, political level is important. In the private sector, the corporate leaders are important and they must comply with this criteria that we mentioned here, all of them. But leadership is also you. And we have a role to play in developing that leadership. So, the appeal is here not only to stability, but actually to inspiration for the present and a direction for the future. You must inspire the present and the future. Leaders must find ways to make people more confident to face the future into which they are being hurtled. When they leave the stability and security of the known and embraces the risks and uncertainty of the unknown, they must be confident. And sometimes we must say to ourselves and to others that as change takes place, we must choose the leaders for that type of changed environment. Okay, I want to close off by saying that each generation, this is Saunders, one of the writers that said this, each generation has to meet and resolve its own leadership problems. And today, we are facing an acute crisis in leadership in many spheres. You will agree with me. Crisis succeeds crisis. Crisis upon crisis. In Africa, yes. One dictator gone, the next one comes in. Hello. Crisis following crisis. Yet our leaders come up with very few solutions. The prognosis is by no means reassuring. What is your prognosis of the future? Is it reassuring? Crisis on crisis. And it's a sad note to end on, but we are Africans. We are part of the continent. And if we don't realize that there are crises, not only here, but in our neighbor, in this and in that, we will find ourselves just limping on and limping on. If you want to talk a little bit economics, just one sentence. We're a developing country, just like Brazil is, about the same level of development. But Brazil moves resolutely forward. They know who they are, what they are, where they are, where they want to go, and private sector, public sector, join hands, labor, join hands. You know, leadership has great challenges, not only in South Africa, but in Africa. And we, as the intellectuals, I may say, those people that are leaders, must think about these things. The one, human rights. Where does culture fit in there? The other challenge is, how do we participate in the development of leadership in Africa? I want to leave those thoughts with you and I'm going to ask you to give them only three minutes to ask questions. Thank you very much. Thank you.